everyone. Just a reminder that as you're joining, um, we've got a poll open and we'd appreciate it if all of the participants, especially the legislators who are attending, if you'd fill out the live poll both now and I believe we'll have at least one more um, later in today's program. And now I see it is the top of the hour. We've got a lot planned for this afternoon. So I'll go ahead and welcome all of you to this roundtable discussion about PFAS in drinking water, the opportunities for addressing the problem, the challenges to doing so, and ideas for communicating with constituents about the risks that PFAS pose to their health and well-being. This session and the two informational sessions that took place last week are co-hosted by the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus, or GLLC, and the Center for Scientific Evidence and Public Issues at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, known as the AAAS Epicenter. <clears throat> I'm Lisa Hanairo with the Council of State Government's Midwestern Office, and I direct the caucus. And I'm joined by my colleague, Rebecca Eicher at the Epicenter and her team at Resolve, including Abby Dilley. Today's session builds on the two informational sessions, and both of those were excellent. I hope everyone either attended one, some attended both, I think, um, or you viewed the recording, because that background information will really help us focus today's discussion on possible solutions that state and provincial legislators can help to facilitate. Um, last week, we did live polling, just like um, you may be seeing right now. Um, and uh, the results showed that more than half the attendees thought PFAS contamination of drinking water is an issue in their community, and half were thinking about advancing uh, legislative policy on this topic. There was also interest in more information and possibly some tools to support legislators' efforts to take action on this important problem that has the potential to affect us all, not just the um, Great Lakes communities and not just the states we'll be hearing from today. Uh, and given the interest in advancing policy, I can tell you that there, the executive committee of the GLLC um, did discuss yesterday whether to uh, prioritize this issue for the caucus in 2021, and it seems like the members are leaning in that direction. So there will be more, more information on that um, at the start of the year. After the presentations, I hope we'll have a really good discussion involving all the participants, both during the Q&A and during the breakout session. And I encourage you all to post your comments or questions in the chat as we go along, or if you prefer, you can wait until those, um, the Q&A period opens and you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. And also, again, please help us fill out any live polls that you see pop up as we go along, as well as the um, post-event evaluation that we'll uh, share with you at the end of the session. I'd like to thank Rebecca, Abby, and their colleagues for all their work over these past few months to organize these sessions and to recruit an impressive group of highly qualified speakers. And finally, I want to thank all the speakers for their willingness to devote their time to helping the region's legislators learn about this really important topic. Now I'll turn the floor over to Rebecca. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Lisa, for that great introduction. Um, just as a quick reminder, I'm Rebecca Eicher from the AAAS Epicenter. Um, and the AAAS, or the American Association for the Advancement of Science, is a science-based nonpartisan organization. And we're very excited to be working with all of you today. Um, as Lisa mentioned, our speakers, as well as all of you who have joined us for this session. Um, our work at the AAAS Epicenter is to provide scientific evidence to decision makers like yourselves to help you incorporate what the scientific community currently knows into the policymaking process. Um, and we've used these, the first two sessions to give you that informational overview related to PFAS. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, our goals for today's session are to really build on the previous sessions and the insights we've gained from the discussion and the experiences that you all have shared and discussed. Um, we're lucky today to have um, folks from two different states who have been addressing PFAS in their communities. Um, so we have folks from Michigan and from North Carolina. Um, and we'd like to use this time to learn from you about your questions and the approaches for potential next steps um, and additional information that might be helpful for you to think about these issues um, in the region or your states. Today, our speakers will be um, Steve Sliver from 
Empart from Michigan. And um, we're also lucky to have Cheryl Murphy from the Michigan State University. And she's the director for the Center for PFAS Research, as well as Jeffrey Warren from the North Carolina Pol Policy Collaboratory, which is an approach that Nor the North Carolina General Assembly is using to support and leverage university research to address PFAS in North Carolina. Um, for those of you who joined us for the first two sessions, we're also very fortunate to have all of our speakers join for that portion, um, for the facilitated discussion that will take place after we hear from our speakers. And we're um, lucky to add Laureen Allen, who brings an important perspective about community um, advocacy and working with communities dealing with PFAS. Um, so that is the list of esteemed speakers that we have for today, as well as panel members to join the discussion. Um, so I think I'll pass it over to Abby to um, review the agenda and, um, oh, I forgot about our poll. So we have our results um, and it looks like most of you did attend or view the first round tables. Just as a reminder, um, we did record the first session, so we're happy to share that with you. Um, and we encourage you to view that to kind of get the um, scientific overview and hear more about um, some community responses and um, Wendy Thomas's perspective as a former state legislator. Um, and it looks like many of you have um, identified that PFAS in drinking water is a problem for your community. Um, and for those of you that aren't sure, um, I hope you'll speak up and ask questions to help figure out the answer to that. And for those of you that it's a no, you are lucky. Um, and um, the likelihood of advancing policy options, I think, you know, we will just talk more about that and hear from you about why you may or may not find it as um, something that could be addressed. So. Thank you for your answers to those questions. And um, I hope that you'll continue to answer our polls and find it useful. So now I'll pass it over to Abby. Thanks, Rebecca. So um, if we could just advance the slide to the agenda. Um, uh, I'm My role today is to uh, handle the moderating duties, um, but want to get right to the core substance of the discussion today. Um, as you can see, just based on the overall objectives that both Lisa and Rebecca referenced, we're trying to provide additional information through these case examples of Michigan and North Carolina, and then have an opportunity for facilitated conversation. Please do use the chat box, or as um, Lisa mentioned, you, we can do the hand raising function on your, uh, your Zoom, the Zoom platform. And that uh, panel session is open uh, to the panelists we have today, as well as those who participated um, in the first two sessions, um, all but Sean Mulholland was able to, to join us today. So we're very fortunate to um, have them participate as well. And then we really want to set aside some time to get into smaller groups. We've got two breakout sessions um, that have very related topics, but a slightly different angle on, um, on one issue or another. One is uh, to focus on community strategies and the other on risk communication. Obviously uh, important uh, that those are interconnected, but just wanted to have the opportunity primarily for you all to have additional time to engage with panelists, but also share your own experiences and insights that you've gained um, over the course of working with your communities or working on issues. Perhaps it's about PFAS and drinking water, perhaps it's about uh, drinking water more broadly or um, also other issues in which you needed to um, engage with your communities and, and communicate uh, difficult uh, issues around environmental exposures or um, issues of concern to your communities. So we will have an opportunity to do, to do that for about uh, 20 minutes, then come back and have some time to uh, engage in a conversation around what additional information, tools, opportunities you would like to, that would help you both assess and um, take steps uh, to address any issues uh, going forward re regarding PFAS and, and drinking water. So with that, um, we will have also have a little bit of time for wrap up evaluation and adjourn um, by either 1.30 or 2.30, depending on what time zone you're on. 
So um, I also just wanted to raise what, what we will do. We wanted to present the um, working group or the breakout session topics so that you have an opportunity to consider. You can either proactively decide between those two sessions, um, the community strategies or risk communication. If, you, if you're not sure or you'd be happy in either one, that's perfectly fine. We can um, uh, put you in one group or another with, with an eye towards balancing the size of the groups. Um, so um, either way, you can either um, uh, select and uh, we'll, when we get to that portion of the agenda, we will give you a little bit more instruction um, on your screen to be able to do that or you can um, be placed into, you can be surprised uh, and uh, be placed into a group um, by that Zoom function. So um, also, again, just want to encourage people to put um, comments in the chat over the course of the session. We will hope to pause and, and be able to take a couple of comments for clarification, but if not, we will accumulate those questions towards the facilitated uh, conversation after the presentations. So I'll pause there. Um, we also are just a, a note, um, similarly to sessions one and two, we are recording the presentation and facilitated the panel discussion portion of this um, workshop, but then a round table, um, but then our, for the breakout sessions, those will not be recorded. So um, just wanted to uh, remind people of that. That also uh, means that those presentations and the information will be um, available uh, as follow-up. So I will pause there. And without further ado, turn to our case examples and hand it over to Steve Sliver um, of MPART and Cheryl Miller at MSU. So Steve, we'll turn to you. All right, well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Let's see if I can get my presentation to go into presentation mode here. Excellent, well, hey, really do appreciate the opportunity today. and. And what I like to always start um, any of my presentations on PFAS with is this conceptual site diagram, which is a reminder, you know, it illustrates a few things, you know, number one, how um, pervasive or ubiquitous uh, these compounds are. And secondly, you know, we all know how persistent they are. And so there's so many pathways of concern. Uh, it's not just water, right? And so our job is really to understand the occurrence of PFAS throughout this cycle so that we can break it and protect public health. And as uh, Director Clark mentioned, I think back in October when she, she spoke with you all is that, you know, Michigan's approach has been, uh, it's a comprehensive and statewide approach beginning with the establishment of Michigan's PFAS action response team, seven departments that joined together on all things related to PFAS and coordinate all of our actions uh, and, and with our primary goal of protecting public health, and as you can see in this list here, uh, we've had to do everything from starting with standardizing our sampling and analytical methods and working our way all the way up to, um, you know, a framework, a regulatory framework for how we move forward with these compounds. And I, I need to, to acknowledge here, Michigan is an advantage over many other states across the country and that we have standards uh, for PFAS in water and now drinking water as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we had them for, for soil and, and groundwater and those standards are so critical for, for driving the investigations and responses, not only by state agencies but also by responsible parties. And again, that the primary goal of these standards is, is protecting public health, and they've got to be based in, in sound data and science. And unfortunately, they're state-led, you know, across the country because we don't have federal standards yet. We should have, but we don't. And, and also acknowledging, you know, how these are continuing to evolve over time. And as, as many of you know, Michigan recently adopted drinking water standards for seven compounds. And I like to show this slide because it shows a couple of things. Number one, that we let the science take us where it would when it comes to what the numbers should be. And you can see they vary from six parts per trillion to 400,000 parts per trillion. And, and it also demonstrates that, you know, that uh, federal recommendation that many of us had been using is, is a little too high. Uh, and uh, now we have 2,700 systems in Michigan that will be testing routinely for these and addressing any uh, uh, concentrations that they find above those standards. 
And those standards have also, as I mentioned before, they're evolving. That's ca causing our groundwater cleanup standards to evolve. We had them at 70 parts per trillion based upon that EPA advisory uh, a couple of years ago. Now we're at eight and 16 because of those uh, drinking water MCLs, maximum contaminant levels. And we just began a rulemaking process for five of those other compounds for groundwater cleanup criteria. And this slide here, I put it up, you've, you've seen it before, uh, just you know, show all the sites across the state, but it does show the statewide scope of what we're doing in, in Michigan. And it doesn't really do justice to PFAS contamination per se. These are groundwater contamination sites, significant as they are. We're also testing ground uh, drinking water sources, uh, surface water, wastewaters, uh, you name it, very comprehensive approach to addressing PFAS contamination. It's kind of, kind of hard to do justice to all of that work, but here I just wanted to highlight not only the statewide scope of this, but again, our, pri our primary uh, concern is protecting drinking water. And so all of these locations were strategically investigated first and because of concerns over whether or not uh, drinking water sources offsite might be, uh, might be impacted. And one of the things that we've learned going forward in our investigations over the past couple of years of how important it is to have an educated public on what PFAS are, what MPART's doing about it. And when we find contamination in a community, how important it is to be transparent, immediately sharing information with the public on what we found, uh, what we're gonna do about it, uh, what all these results might mean for them. And so we have a, a very robust program when it comes to engaging communities and starting with local officials and legislators. Uh, uh, legislators are key for our outreach in communities and, and making sure that uh, we're getting to the right people and, and all that the information that we're sharing is, is uh, getting through. We do town halls uh, routinely, typically, uh, sometimes within uh, days or weeks of finding a result if we have to go do uh, investigations of residential wells off-site. And we maintain a lot of information out there on the web, not just for these impacted communities, but generally to keep the public informed. And, and we continually adapt our protocols to make sure that we're being effective. And I just share this because, you know, it's a good reminder that um, adapting to the community is important. This is a public here or town hall meeting that we had in Hartford uh, back last year in August. And there is a large contingent of Spanish uh, uh, speaking uh, people there. And, and so we had to do separate sessions as well, just to make sure that the messages were getting to them uh, in, in a language that they understood. And we continue to adapt as well in this virtual world on uh, outreach and town halls. And, and sometimes even these virtual meetings don't get through to everybody, so we're adapting to make sure that we have effective outreach. Um, I'd also like to, you know, highlight the fact of how important the legislative support is for everything that we've done in Michigan from the appropriations and, as I mentioned before, and making sure that we have effective community outreach. Funding. You know, so Michigan has, you know, we, we are fortunate to have uh, legislative support for funding and you know, bipartisan support over the past three years, over $70 million. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a big figure, but it's gone to all these expanded environmental investigations, um, standing up our lab to do the type of analytical work that's required for this, and, and building up our, our GIS and mapping support and providing that public health response when we find contamination in communities, you know, whether it's point of use filters in homes and other things that we can do to address those exposures immediately while we're doing these investigations and the importance of supporting our local health agencies, our partners, our boots on the ground, so to speak. And it's also included $4 million in grants to our municipal airports. And we're right now in the middle of a $25 million grant program for municipal water systems. 
And I can tell you that these dollar amounts aren't, aren't, uh, aren't enough, uh, but they're, they're a great start. Uh, and and we, we can see a need out there for many more dollars and, and, and in a time of scarcity, especially, um, it's gonna be a challenge going forward. And I, I wanna uh, highlight here as well, um, one policy area is the aqueous film forming foam, which we know that this, the class B foam that has PFAS has caused lots of contamination. Michigan's um, not immune from the type of contamination for the use of this foam for fighting fires. And our state fire marshal uh, was proactive a couple of years ago and asked all the fire departments across the state if they had it and develop best practices for when they use it. And that once we found out how much was out there, that led to a program to collect and dispose of what's not needed. And there's a lot of agencies that were happy to get rid of it. And unfortunately, our legislators supported $1.4 million uh, contract to collect 52,000 gallons, probably the most we've collected anywhere in the country yet. And that also led to legislation regulating um, the use of any of these foams that need to be kept in the inventories, not using them in training and reporting when they are used so that we can make sure the environment uh, impacts have been addressed. And educating the firefighters as well uh, has been huge. And, and just a, a note here as well, when it comes to prevention side, market-driven limitations are working on other products like food packaging and, and uh, other materials. Uh, and really to address those, I'm not so sure how successful we'll be at the state level. Uh, and, and really where there's, that's a, a national uh, policy need for sure. So anyway, just to end with, uh, you know, some key takeaways here that, you know, Michigan, you know, we believe firmly in, in the coordinated comprehensive response is the reason we've been so successful with MPART. And, and moving forward, whether it's developing standards or uh, regulating things like uh, the AFFF, you know, using evidence-based policy making is the way to go and, and defensible long-term and the importance of transparency, educating your public and sharing information as quickly as possible has been key. And yes, the funding is um, going forward gonna continue to be a challenge. And I'll stop there and hand off to Cheryl. All right, can you see my screen? It's okay. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, and um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Michigan State's done in uh, at Michigan State University um, in response to this PFAS. And actually, it, it was triggered by um, the state's response to this. Actually, um, we noticed that they were they were they were measuring and putting a huge effort into PFAS um, surveys and 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 trying to find ways to mitigate. Um, and so as a response to that, we put together a working group at Michigan State University to see how MSU could respond with all of our expertise that we have to this, this complicated problem. And so as we're putting together this working group, it made, we, we found that uh, PFAS, the, it, the, the research sort of spans all sorts of elements of our mission. Um, and so as a result, it made sense for us to put together a research center um, and so um, this, I'm just putting, there's a lot of people involved. And so, um, and I'll, I'll probably, I'll, I'll bring up a slide showing the, the levels of expertise that we have engaged in the center. Um, but, but just looking at this, we have six different colleges across our campus that are, are have been, in, uh, are interested in working with us so far. Um, and we're in, anticipating a lot more to work with us as we grow. It's just that we, we launched the center during COVID. And so it's been a little bit hard to get everybody together, um, but we, we anticipate this growing and, and, and expanding um, where we have all these different areas of expertise that can lend a hand to this very, very complicated problem. Um, and this, uni this center, um, it, it was approved in, in March, I believe, and so then it, um, it, it's a university-wide center. So um, it's endorsed by the university, the vice president of research and Innov in innovation um, and, and we got some seed funding to get it going. And so this is, this is where we're at at the moment. Um, and so I'll just give you an example of what we, what we found. Um, as we were going through and looking at the literature and what, what, what was happening in Michigan and, and what, what, is the level, what is the expertise that we have at Michigan State, 
um, we found that there was some big unknowns and needs that, that are perfect for a university um, uh, setting a, an academic institution to, to tackle. Um, first of all, uh, we know that there's lots of PFAS in the environment. There's over 6,000 of them now, I believe. Um, which chemicals are there and how much? Um, how are they con contributing to the health effects, especially in the context of uh, multiple stressors and multiple organisms? Um, how do they transport through the environment, accumulate into our, our biology, into our, our fish, our wildlife, our food? Um, and how do they go through the environment and end up in our food? Um, how do we figure out safe and effective removal of these, these contaminants and, and replacement of them? Because they're obviously, there's, they seem to be um, a very valued compound. That's why we have so many of them. So how do we find safer, safer alternatives? And then also, how do we communicate risk and formulate policy with all this uncertainty surrounding all of these chemicals? So we, we formed this area of center of expertise and, and we found that we could fit in within the six main areas of inquiry, essentially. And, and there's people listed in each of these um, and we're anticipating this to grow. And some people fit in multiple categories, but we found that it, we, could, we could coalesce them into six, six main groups, but these groups are all interconnected. So we need a center, we need, we need people all of these groups communicating and interacting with it, with each other to be able to tackle such a such a problem. Um, right in the middle, of course, is discovery and measurement. We have to figure out what's out there and how to measure it, and then develop standards. Um, so we know that they're they're in water, drinking water, and there's some standards developed. We found them in in soil and, and in some foods, but there's hundreds thousands of species, crops, blueberries, you know, milk, cheese, etc. All these standards sort of have to be developed with good laboratory practices. So we have uh, um, that, that in mind there. Um, we also have to determine how it's impacting um, humans, fish, wildlife. Um, and so because it's such a complicated issue with 6,000 of these chemicals on all of these different species, we can't take a traditional tox approach like a dose response, we have to do more systems toxicology. So we have people that are representing various levels of biological organization from how the, the, the compounds bind to proteins to how that regulates genes and, and the metabolome all the way up to, to how do you translate all that to the uh, whole population and, and, um, and, um, and some community effects. Um, we have it, how is it moving into our food? How is it going through the soil, into the solids, into people? Um, and then how is it going in, how is it transported in the environment, um, exposure, bioactivity and biomonitoring. So we know these chemicals, we can't, going out and measuring everything is probably not a feasible approach. So is there some bioactivity approach where we take biology and see, okay, is there a hit here? And then go back and measure and figure out what's causing a hit to some particular um, biological response. So taking different approaches to that um, but down here at the bottom too, we have a risk assessment and communication team where we have people that look at risk communication, um, a philosopher of science, what are the best approaches? We have um, people in public policy um, as well, how, they're, how do we deal with all this uncertainty and, and, and convert that to, to, to policy changes, as well as how do we assess the risk with all this uncertainty as well. So, and we also have a, a lot of colleagues and extension involved um, and then risk management, we have to remediate these chemicals and develop safer alternatives. And so we have a number of engineers involved as well as we have a really strong packaging program at MSU. So if we can connect the development of packaging materials in, in, in conjunction with like some green chemistry approaches, um, maybe we can move forward. So that's kind of the areas of expertise that we put together. Our idea is that we have this multidisciplinary team to tackle this very complex interdisciplinary problem. It's very comprehensive outlook and it's solutions based. Um, and we know all of these individuals could probably work on PFAS individually, but following the state's lead, it's, it's better if we're all sort of interacting together um, and, and so that we can also interact with state and federal partners. Um, it's also consistent with MSU's land grant mission. Um, and we can embed this within our well-developed outreach programs. Um, so that's our solutions approach is to lead the development of PFAS measurements standards in food, water, and biology, mitigate it from agricultural natural products, 
develop green chemistry guided alternatives, um, advance the state of the art design for rapid, safe and effective remediation technologies. Um, there's a number of them that have been proposed, but these have to be scaled up and, and determine if they're economically feasible or technically feasible. Um, we, we wanna be able to some communicate risk and be sort of a collaboration hub between you know, uh, government and you know, um, academia and industry, et cetera, uh, and, 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 and of course the community. And so why MSU is doing this? Because we have those unique strengths in agriculture, natural resources, human health, systems, biology, packaging and engineering. We have really good interdisciplinary team building expertise at our campus. Um, this was a competitive and solutions approach center that will complement other efforts. There's some that are in Rhode Island and in North Carolina and, and the focus where we're going through how it's going into the water, into our food and natural resources is a nice complement to these existing things. And, and, and honestly, there should be more centers just because this, this problem is so complex. Um, and then we establish regional partnerships. We know that there's a number of people in the area, in the Great Lakes area, in, in the Midwest that are working on, on, on PFAS, so it'd be great if we could collaborate with them as well with our state community and industry partners. And so we've started, we, we, we just got started, launched in March. Oh, we have a number of individual projects. We have like going through the, the, the Huron River, we have how it's going into fish um, and it, um, immunotoxicity into, into the communities, um, how it's going into biosolids. Um, so that's what we've started on. Each individual member has been like submitting grants like crazy. Um, but for the next year, we're expected to, we got some seed money, so we'll start to develop that. Um, as, um, we want to establish accredited lab. Um, uh, we want to build together as a center to get some, a larger funding for the center, um, um, initiate these systems biology frameworks and develop standards for PFAS measurements in a lot of different matrices. Um, and then we have a few upcoming events, just in case you're interested. We have, we think we can, we can, we can start to educate. We can a, 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 um, offer courses. We have one that I'm, I'm offering this week, actually. Um, it's called for adverse outcome pathways. This is the systems talk approaches. Um, we have, we're going to have a research showcase, which is an, inter, an interactive forum, and then also um, some. We have some brown bag things that we're starting up. So we're expecting this to grow um, over the years. And, so, and that's all I have. Great, thank you so much. And I think we're, we're, we are trying to make the slides available. So some of the resources and events that you have listed, um, Cheryl could be part of that information that's distributed to participants. So I'd like to turn to Jeff Warren and have him give his overview of the North Carolina program. And please do um, submit questions to the chat box because we can come back to um, Steve and Cheryl and uh, Jeff at the conclusion of uh, Jeff's remarks and ask some questions and then we'll open it up more broadly to all the panelists who've been able to participate with us. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And I apologize, I'm gonna be staring off screen at a different monitor. Um, my name is uh, Jeff Warren. I'm the executive director of the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory based at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and prior to that, I was the science advisor to the North Carolina Senate for seven years. Uh, I started here at the collaboratory in 2017. We were created in 2016 by our legislature um, to handle policy, to basically bridge the policy and research expertise across the entire UNC system with the legislatures and other statewide policymaking officials, uh, kind of a very unique model. Uh, we have 17 campuses in our system, 15 of those are research university institutions. Um, initially, right out of the gate, uh, we were focusing on natural resource issues. Um, and there's more information about all of our projects um, at collaboratory.unc.edu. I posted this link and another link in the chat. Um, and so what happened in, so we began in 2016, what happened in 2017 was that uh, the first article here on your screen uh, was reported by the Star News Online, some results from Detlef Kanapa at NC State and Mark Streiner at the EPA, among others, um, was finding Gen X in the Cape Fear River. That's how North Carolina uh, got involved in the PFAS discussion. Uh, this is all rolling out in 2017, and the response of our legislatures was in 2018, they passed funding um, through 
a multitude, but it ended up in the budget. Uh, it started as the Clean Water Act, um, and it was a five million dollar, thirteen thousand, five million thirteen thousand dollars appropriation to the collaboratory to facilitate the North Carolina PFAS testing network across seven different universities, seven of our UNC universities and Duke. Um, we, we got going, we've got a lot of different teams and I'm not gonna belabor all of the, the work we're doing. I'm just trying to kind of tell you our model. Uh, unlike Michigan, which approached this, the legislators put the money right into the regulators' hands. Um, the North Carolina model, uh, the money went to the research hands. There was some, there were some additional appropriations to our DEQ, but that was a point of contention with a lot of the stakeholders. Um, so this was a very uh, controversial issue at the time. Uh, the one good thing that we've done is the collaboratory has been able to utilize another $2 million in our own funding that we also received from the legislatures, uh, legislators um, to supplement these programs. So we've had about $7 million in direct, event, uh, in direct investment of PFAS research. Um, I know that the last count, our research teams here have been able to leverage the initial funding and the pilot data and the methods they've built for another $15 million in grants, including NC State's new PFAS Superfund Research Center. Uh, some of the highlights are Team One water sampling team. We've got 405 public drinking water sites across the state uh, where we're doing water analyses of the raw water. Uh, the first round is done. We're a hip deep in the second round of that sampling. Um, we've got a, uh, a private well risk modeling team, a PFAS removal and performance testing team, an air emissions and atmospheric deposition team, and an applied research team, as well as a risk communication um, and a data management team. And another real cool thing coming out of our uh, PFAS removal team is that we've got uh, a group led here at Chapel Hill by Frank Leibfarth in chemistry in Orlando Cornell over at Environmental Science and Engineering. Uh, they've already got patents in place for a new ionic, ionic floor gel resin that you may have read about earlier this year in some of the uh, peer-reviewed publications uh, that seem to do really well in removing PFAS and adsorbing them to the resin. Uh, we are currently trying to find additional funding from our state to kind of ramp up production and get into a larger pilot phase deployment of that. Um, and I know that front and center uh, on many of these lawmakers heading into the next biennium starting next year will be additional PFAS dollars, not only for our DEQ and our DHHS agencies, but also for the collaboratory. Um, so I'm just kind of kind of ended there. You've got the URL to do a deeper dive. Uh, my contact information is on our collaboratory website. Um, it's also fairly easy if you just go and email collaboratory at unc.edu, it will come right to my inbox. And I would love to um, look at discussions and, and have discussions with other folks and talk about our model and the pros and cons to it because every state kind of has a unique approach to this. Thanks so much, Jeff um, and Steve and, and Cheryl. What I wanted to do is open it up to questions since people haven't had a chance to ask you uh, questions about your presentation specifically, and then we've we have some other questions for you as well. But um, while people are entering, and thank you for the information in the chat box um, as well, um, Jeff. Uh, while people are submitting questions, why don't we? Um, I'd like to ask the three of you um, how much it was um, a challenge uh, for your state. Uh, to act without any national um, activity or federal level activity. And then just following on to that, if um, you know EPA is considering standards, once they do act, how do you think that may or may not affect the programs that your respective states have, uh, have developed? Well, I'll jump in to start. Uh, the lack of federal standards hasn't slowed us down, um, you know, but I think when it comes to federal facility cleanups, that's where having national standards would be really helpful because we have to go through the process of demonstrating that our state standards were properly promulgated and applicable for these sorts of cleanups. And that's a challenge, especially at uh, Department of Defense sites. Now, the, you know, when EPA comes out with drinking water standards, for example, we suspect that'll be another three to five years from now, we will be well along in implementing 
um, the state's um, safe drinking water standards. And um, if they come out different than ours, um, it, it might make it a little more challenging on the messaging. Um, but again, we'll be so far along implementing seven and we suspect two, three, five years from now, they might only have it for two. Jeff, anything you wanna add in terms of whether that's affected or not affected really your, um, your program? Um, I have heard uh, a lot of our legislators, uh, there obviously are a cohort that want to move forward with uh, putting in state standards and another that want to wait for the results of our study. The good news is, is our study is coming out, uh, our group of studies in April. Um, obviously, COVID slowed everybody down. It certainly shut our labs for three to four months. So we had to request an extension from December to, to April or October to April. So I do think that will be coming right in the middle of our legislative session, the first in the biennium, which is our long session. Um, and there will be some recommendations in there that potentially are actionable and some data in there that could help drive those decisions. But, um, you know, right now, uh, in the absence of federal standards, everybody is kind of left adrift and uh, I'll, I'll be anxious to see how we can help our state lawmakers move forward if they wanna set up some standards. Great, thank you. I have a couple of questions that were submitted, uh, some in the chat box, um, Steve um, or Jeff or Cheryl or anyone, um, if you're aware of any information on this issue on um, in a language Hmong, um, you mentioned Spanish and there may be some French uh, out there given that we have some uh, Canadian colleagues joining this conversation, but where you go for sources for translation and uh, if you have any resources along those lines to share. Um, we have some uh, resources to the state. We have not had any translations done into Hmong or um, others, but um, we're working in a, a community, uh, Arabic community, where it's likely we'll need to tra uh, translate some of our resources for them. And of course, you know, that's a challenge too, is, uh, you know, identifying first the community and, and local leaders are great for helping us identify uh, where we, you know, we should get translations done, but nothing in Hmong yet. Great, I have um, related questions and you just mentioned this about identifying communities. There are a couple of questions uh, relevant along those lines in terms of how you would recommend going about identifying detection sites how you how you did that in Michigan and North Carolina, and then also for those um, areas that have not started, where do we start sampling um, efforts to assess contamination? So, if you're starting with a clean slate, knowing what you know, either both um, just how you went about it and how whatever lessons learned, you would recommend others start. Well, we started uh, well. We first saw some PFAS contamination associated with a former military installation, and then and then it uh, showed up in a real big way associated with a tannery operations, the the Wolverine Worldwide site. And uh, so, looking at resources available to all of us, like the ITRC, you know, talking about here's where you you know industries that have used PFAS, everything from landfills, airports. Uh, old industrial sites, chrome platers. We basically looked across the landscape in Michigan where these locations were and then prioritized where we would look based upon whether or not we were concerned about potential offsite drinking water impacts first. And that's how we found those you know, roughly 150 sites. And we've got additional prioritized site investigations occurring right now. Some of these show up as well, like in the city of Parchment where we were doing a public water system survey and found really high concentrations there. And that led us to identify some uh, PFAS sites uh, right in the vicinity there that were impacting their wells. In North Carolina, um, obviously our DEQ uh, immediately started uh, upon the reports of Gen X and the Cape Fear River, started looking at the Kimores facility in Cumberland County near Fayetteville um, and looking at surrounding counties. Uh, we have a challenge here that I believe we have one of the largest per capita uh, populations of people on private groundwater in the nation and our private wells are not regulated. So that's an additional challenge. Uh, but when our study was mandated by the legislation, um, 
we were told to look at every public water uh, intake as defined by our DEQ. So we worked with them to establish the 405 data points. Interestingly enough, we found that most of it's in surface water, as you would expect. Uh, we've had very few incidents of groundwater issues um, with the exception of some aquifer recharge and reuse situations down near Wilmington. Um, we found one tiny town of 2000, the town of Maysville in Jones County um, that had a, over 100 PPT in their well and did not know it, their sole drinking water well in the town. And we were able to alert them and they were able to switch over to the county interconnect, which was thankfully PFAS free. Um, we think that well may have been exposed to AFFF because it's about a block from the fire department and those uh, markers are certainly there. Um, and, you know, I, my guess is it's poor well construction and how that got into the well bore. Um, so they're looking to replace their well. And we've also been able to do some follow-up studies with AFFF use on tanker fires and then basically tracking the fate and transport uh, in the surface water. So we've got some interesting data coming out um, shortly on a small little tanker fire that occurred in the, the hamlet of Denver, North Carolina, north of Charlotte, uh, and the staggering numbers of PFAS contamination that came out just from about 900 gallons of AFFF uh, that was found 30 miles downstream the Catawba River uh, near the Belmont water intake with hundreds of parts per trillion. So it's a kind of a fascinating study, but most of our sites besides the regulatory sites um, were, were defined in our legislation. And you, do you want to elaborate at all, Jeff, on how you're tackling the private well challenge? So the good news is, is there are a lot of interested stakeholders in uh, Brunswick County, New Han which is just south of the Cape Fear, New Hanover County, which is where Wilmington is, uh, and Cumberland County, which is where the Fayetteville Works facility for Camores is. We've had a lot of people that want to take part in this and open up their wells for um, analysis. Uh, that are happy to take some of the pilot programs being administered by our researchers and our regulatory agencies with filtration. Uh, we've even had people come forward with jarred and canned vegetables and frozen vegetables that track back three or four years uh, that we can actually go and look at PFAS concentrations historically. Obviously, uh, canned vegetables, you can't really because it was canned in the water from the well, uh, that's kind of a non-starter, but we were able to look at some root cellar vegetables and whatnot, and that's another side study. Um, and a lot of folks have come forward with pets. We have a, tox uh, a toxicology project um, in the Grays Creek area near Oak Mills, which is near Fayetteville, uh, where we've had some high incidence of horses and cats and dogs. Uh, that have had issues. So we've started a toxicology project with that as well. So a lot of the private well owners uh, are rural folks, uh, but they've been more than happy to participate proactively. Great, thanks very much. A couple of other quick questions and then we'll open it up to um, the broader set of panelists. Um, but wanted to ask um, Steve, if you have tested Great Lakes waters and what if anything have you found? Uh, yes, and we've done a number of surveys of our surface water bodies. Uh, we've integrated PFAS testing into the you know, same type of testing you do for other persistent toxics, uh, you know, like PCBs and whatnot. The Great Lakes, like Lake Huron, Michigan, um, Superior, they don't have uh, concentrations most of the time that's even reportable of PFAS. And our connecting channels, for the most part, are down around 2, 2.5 parts per trillion of PFOS, which is probably the one that most people are concerned about the most because it's bio, most bioaccumulative. But in some of our smaller channels and whatnot, we do find uh, concentrations. We found during our survey of all the public water supplies a couple of years, a few systems where the, the concentrations were fluctuating a bit. And that, and, and that helped us to do some source tracking in those areas. But the, the, the greater uh, body of water, uh, not really seeing it. Thank you. And um, to any of you, um, the extent to which tribal governments and our stakeholders are engaged in um, your state activities. And that could be true for you, Cheryl, too, in terms of involvement and research. 
we did uh, do the uh, tribal systems for any of the, uh, the tribal governments that were willing to let us do that. We coordinated that with EPA when we did the public water system survey. And um, we are uh, working and reaching out uh, to like the, the tribal leadership council to let them know what resources we have available in MPART. Uh, should they you know, need some assistance, especially in the public health side, uh, but, you know, they, they do have uh, members that, you know, live, you know, in, in various parts of the state where we do have PFAS contamination. So we always try to make sure they're looped into our uh, tribal liaison. Great. And in North Carolina, Jeff, um, much engagement of tribal communities? Um, so there's been a lot of engagement in Robeson County with the Lumbee people. Um, probably not so much in the western part with the Cherokee Nation because we're not really seeing PFAS issues out west. Um, but yes, there has been, and I've got to give uh, a shout out to some of our comms folks, as well as our regulatory agencies that have worked really hard to do a lot of education and information sessions um, out in those rural areas, um, as well as some of our um, NGOs like the Coastal Federation that set up multiple panels um, out in these rural areas. But yeah, there has been direct engagement with the Lumbee. Great. Thank you. Um, well, just one last question. Just know, uh, as given that this is a Great Lakes um, St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus, just as you think about the work, reflect back on the work that you've done, and then going forward, um, would a regional approach have been helpful in seeking partnerships and information sharing and doing some of this work collectively? Could that have been of benefit? Absolutely. Um, we just over the past year started engaging in the Great Lakes PFAS Task Force that was um, started by the Great Lakes uh, St. Lawrence governors and premiers. And really what that does, it's, it's information sharing and it's leveraging resources. For, I'll give you one example, biosolids, we're all trying to understand what's going on with land application of uh, in, impacted biosolids. What does that do to soil, groundwater, crops? And there, there's too much there for any one state to do. And, but by uh, coordinating with the states in the Great Lakes area, you know, we, we can each take different pieces of it, go do our thing, come back, compare notes later, and come up with what we hope to be a report for the Great Lakes region on land application of biosolids. Yeah, I, I want to springboard off of Steve's comment, uh, and thank you for saying that because it uh, jiggled my memory. Um, here in Chapel Hill, Carborough, right around UNC, uh, we found that uh, we believe the signature of the PFAS contamination in Orange County's water supply is the land application of biosolids around one of their drinking water reservoirs. Great. Um, so while we're focused on the fact that uh, it's Great Lakes, I know, Phil um, Brown, you had reminded us that uh, the Great Lakes was the focus of other work that had been done. Um, pretty critical in terms of emerging contaminants or c contaminants at the time weren't very well known. I just wanted to, if you wondered if you wanted to speak to that um, before I turn to Lorraine to introduce her and um, ask a question of her. But Phil, are you there and able to uh, share with uh, the rest of the group what you shared with us earlier? Sure. I think that people up there should be proud of this legacy. And though in the Great Lakes Commission research some years ago, uh, they hired a biologist, Theo Colborn, to do some research there. And she did something very similar to what Rachel Carson did when she put together the book Silent Spring. She accumulated hundreds upon hundreds of research articles that nobody had ever thought to synthesize before and discovered that there were a huge number of chemicals that were disrupting the endocrine systems in many different ways. And she really was at the center of discovering what was then called the endocrine disruption hypothesis, which seemed like a very radical departure in those days. Now, we're very aware that endocrine disruption is very central to all environmental health. And so she wrote a book called Our Stolen Future, which is a beautiful book. It's very accessible because she had two co-authors, another biologist and a science journalist. Pete Myers uh, was the, the other biologist and Diane Dumanoski was the journalist. And Our Stolen Future was really the landmark book that helped to put this together. Before that, she had put together the Wingspread Conference in Wisconsin. 
and that brought together scientists from all over who were able to help to synthesize this material along with her. And so that legacy has been very important for all endocrine disrupting compounds. But uh, in particular, in her later years, when she was in her uh, 70s, she started the group called the Endocrine Disruption Exchange in Colorado. And they were kind of the central repository for this. And one of the things that she found, of course, the huge amount of fracking going on in Colorado. So she then took up uh, a lot of investigation into the endocrine disrupting chemicals used in fracking. Uh, later on, uh, folks at the Endocrine Dis Disruption Exchange decided to put together a huge database on PFAS, and that's uh, now ongoing. And even though the group no longer is funded and operating, they do have a website, which is endocrinedisruption.org, endocrinedisruption.org. Uh, and on there, you can find information about their uh, scoping review of PFAS science. So this legacy that goes all the way back to Theo Colborn is now with you in current work on PFAS that can help all of us. Hey, thanks, Phil. And I just wanted to introduce um, also Lorene Allen, who will be participating in the breakout sessions too. But Lorene um, is a community advocate and has worked with her colleague, Wendy Thomas, as well, who we heard from in the first two sessions. And I think you know, just to set us up for these breakout sessions to talk about communicating risk and um, engaging communities, if you could uh, make a couple of comments about uh, the unique role that legislators have and how they've been helpful to you in addressing drinking water and um, PFAS contamination. Hi, uh, I just wanna say the work in Michigan and North Carolina just blows us away. In Michigan with MSU and MPART, you have set the gold standard all we have to do is zap that into every state and the North Carolina work with reaching out to private wells and your partnership with your community groups there. Awesome, awesome. So my name is Lorene Allen. You know, I found out in uh, March of 2016 that I had been drinking uh, PFAS chemicals along with my family, neighbors and community and five surrounding communities for at least two decades. So uh, very, very troubling. Um, so when we started this journey, the legislators in charge they're citizens in New Hampshire. Elected officials are not scientists. They're not academics in New Hampshire, the live free or die state, right? So uh, where do they turn for information? They turned to uh, 3M, believe it or not, who, who has a facility in Northern New Hampshire, which I didn't realize about. So they gave them some great slides, not, that really omitted and minimized the problem. So these are humans, you know, who they're looking for direction. They're saying, what are these chemicals? What are we gonna do about them? So back in 2016, the legislative direction and our elected officials in towns were getting guidance that were really not complete. So we had some residents at that time who said, something is not right here. Um, you know, Phil gave some good resources, endocrine exchange and things like that. Uh, so what people find in this day of Google searching is there is immense, immense resources out there. There are academics and scientists who, this is not new to them. That blew me away. The people that I met who have been knowledgeable in this area for far longer than we realized it was a problem. So um, what we did is we had to do a ground up approach. We had to engage legislators. So we educated ourselves. We knew what our needs were. Uh, we became strangely enough our own experts and we had to engage them. We had to help them define that in fact, this was a problem. And, um, and who were we, you know, they're, they're hearing from experts, you know, not just people. Uh, Wendy the other day talked about that, you know, the crazy ladies, the fear mongers. So we started there. So we had a series of um, events, you know, where we were initiating the work. So I like the fact now that we've evolved across the nation to the initiation is coming from the states because they need to do this. As they test, they find it, right? So they have to take the lead. So community groups uh, from the beginning of this, over so the last four years, have taken the lead and we have engaged so um, after the first year and a half of this, we voted in new representative, representatives, including Wendy and others, who were very informed on this topic. Uh, we had educated each other. They went up to Concord. They educated more legislators. And now we had some great momentum going. So at that point, what we found is it took a little while to get there, but we did. Legislators were very active listeners. 
they realized that they needed to know. And they realized, strangely enough, we knew a lot of stuff. They're like, how do you know all this stuff? It was kind of funny. So the listening sessions, um, the tuning into the community needs, and the awareness that this isn't just Merrimack and surrounding communities, this is all over New Hampshire, all over the United States, Canada, and other countries. So listening, tuning in, and then they had to translate what are our needs and how do they translate into legislation? What can they do? You know, what in life prepared them for this? So they needed to, you know, consult and figure out what they could do. And to their credit, you know, they realized that we needed to be active partners. So I think for anyone going through this, you know, your communities need to be engaged. You need to build trust with them because if you don't, they aren't going to trust you. So the trust of citizens who step forward to lead is there in the communities. We have engagement with the communities. We have relationships with allies and resources. And um, it's that liaison between us and legislators that is really important because not every legislator, you know, has those resources, making them packets, giving them packets. So I think um, when we became more involved in the, um, what do we call it, the sausage making mill, right, so to speak, that we're sitting at the table, we were now considered uh, stakeholders, because to my surprise, in the beginning of this journey, stakeholders didn't list community groups or community representatives, they listed business, industry, municipality, towns, of course they're stakeholders. But, you know, we started this seat at the table movement uh, nationally, and that was very important. So that's just a little bit of an overview of the importance of those relationships, uh, which Steve had touched upon, nailed it. You know, I can't say more about that. And I'll stop because it's too much. <laughs> Thanks. No, Lorraine, thank you so much. And I think that's a great setup to getting into our breakout sessions where we can workshop these issues a little bit more. Um, Great, thank you. So I wanna to turn to Rebecca to start wrapping up and um, post the evaluation. And we'll um, also uh, just wanna thank everybody. And there's the poll. Yes. Um, well, thank you all. Thank you for um, all the panelists and speakers spending time with us to talk through these questions and um, help us understand. And thank you to all the um, participants today. It's been interesting. The series has been great. Um, and we're really here to help you and help you understand um, what's happening in your states and how we might be able to be useful in providing more information. Um, if you are interested in um, legislative briefings that you think we might be able to help you with or additional series similar to this or extensions of the topics that we're talking about today, we would be happy to work with Lisa um, or any of you as you think through what's happening in your states, communities, and the Great Lakes region. Um, we do have an evaluation that would be really helpful if um, if everyone could save that. Erin, um, I don't know if you can put that in the chat for us. Um, and then, you know, these are the same poll questions that you answered in um, the first or the second round table, as well as the beginning of this session. And, um, you know, the question of, do you think PFAS in drinking water is a problem for your community? Um, we see that there aren't any no's at this point, um, a couple of not sure's and the rest are yeses. Um, and whether it's likely of advancing policy options, um, I don't think we've seen a big change from the beginning to this um, answer, but we would just like to emphasize that we are here to help. And if there are um, opportunities where you think the science and um, more evidence could help inform that process, we'd be happy to be involved with um, connecting you with people that can answer your questions. So there is the link to our survey. So we would really appreciate um, any feedback there. And we welcome um, any last minute questions or um, any panelists that would like to say anything, please feel free. 
I have a last minute comment and um, a thank you, of course, to Rebecca and Abby and Steve and Jeff and all the speakers. Um, it, this has really been informative. I, I was in a book club discussion last night in my neighborhood and not a single person had any awareness at all of this issue. So now I think there are going to be a lot of people watching Dark Waters and <laughs> The Devils We Know um, and checking out, checking out the video because I shared the link to our video. Um, but I did want to put in one more plug for the, um, especially the caucus members who are participating. Please do fill out the survey that's uh, linked in the chat. Um, there is a question at the end specifically about whether you feel the GLLC should take this up as an issue in 2021. I mentioned the executive committee had talked about this a little bit yesterday, um, but that information from all of you, your, your uh, votes on that will certainly help inform that discussion. So thanks again, everyone. And Rebecca, I'll turn it back to you to close it out. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And yes, the more you talk to people about PFAS, the more you will find out there. They have lots of questions and most hadn't yet heard of it. And now it's all they'll hear about. So um, thank you all for your time and joining us. And um, again, to all the speakers and to all of you who have participated in this and Lisa for providing us the opportunity to share this with um, the caucus and other, other participants. Much appreciated. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye now.